I was going through a couple things. And some of you know. Let's see if I can get this thing going. Yeah. Aren't, aren't, aren't these flowers beautiful? Yeah. These here? And Joy, that was like, wow, what a follow-up from, from our singing that song. And then you come up and playing that organ. And as I'm sitting up here listening to you, I'm thinking, boy, we've got a future organist here. And I can see him playing for a church or even playing at one of our colleges up front there with the, you know, the big organs, the big pipe organs, you know. Go for the gusto. Anyway, um, yeah, I was having, my mother, you know, really got sick with this thing that's going around. And then my wife got sick. So I had to tend to her, and she's kind of come back real fast from it, which is shocking. But I've been kind of fighting it, but I haven't gotten it like full bore yet. So keep praying. And then I had a right toe problem, and that's all cleared up, and thanks to antibiotics and all that kind of stuff, and good doctors. And uh, you, you know, the Lord's good. He, he watches over us all the time. So. Uh, I, I've been working on uh, th this message the Lord has been uh, slowly evolving through me. And it says the Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden. Eastward in Eden. Keep that in mind. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And then God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden. To what? To tend and keep it. So he kind of put him to work. Literally. Gave him something to do. Keep him occupied. And busy. And learning. As uh, my wife says every day, I'm learning, I'm learning, I'm learning. My name, most of you know my last name, but I'm going to give you a little history lesson. It's Baumgartner. I remember going through high school, it got mutilated. Baumgartner, Baumy, Baum, you know, they just mispronounced it and mutilated it. But what it named is the name is a surname of origin, German origin, literally meaning tree gardener. Okay? Occupational name of a worker of an orchard. Well, guess what? I'm living up to my name. Because in Ferndale, guess what I have? I have an orchard. And I have 12 fruit trees. 12 fruit trees. I have fig. A couple figs, a couple pears, a couple plums, four apple trees, cherry trees, plum cots. Yeah, it's fun. And I love getting out there and, you know, tending to them and, you know, keeping them strong and healthy and providing fruit and pruning them. That's the hard part. Pruning them and then getting rid of the pruning remnants and it's work. It's hard work. It's not easy work. When I was in Germany, I was stationed there for three years. And it was, it was a, a plush, you know, time for me in the military because I was overseas, got to travel, and Germany of all places, and I have this wonderful German name. And so as I'm walking around in the village in, in uh, Zweibrücken, where I was stationed, the Germans would glance at me, look down at my name tag, and they would say, Herr, Herr Baumgartner. You know, that's how they pr pronounce it over there. Herr Baumgartner. And you've got the little umlauts over that A there. And they start sprechen sie Deutsch to me right away. And I'm saying, okay, ein bisschen sprechen sie Deutsch. And they would look at me, they would look at my name, and they would burst out in a laugh. They think that was just the biggest joke they've ever seen. Here's this wonderful person here with his wonderful German name and he can't speak Deutsch. He can't speak German. Which is, they don't understand that. They just can't understand that. Garden of Eden. We can't really comprehend what it really, really, really looked like. But I know it just had to be perfect and it had to be beautiful. Just knock down, drag out all your senses. Just stimulated to the max in this garden. And, you know, I'm looking forward to being back. I, you know, I love gardens. And I know the Lord loves gardens. Because, of all things, the first thing he did was provided a garden home for Adam and Eve. So that says a lot. 
And I wondered about garden, the Garden of Eden. I said, you know, you know, he and Dave read about the rivers, the four rivers, and and you say, okay, where exactly is it? Where was it? I mean, it's not really important to know, but it'd be good to kind of know maybe where it might be. So as we do a little bit of investigation, we'll find out. It says, And a river went out from Eden to the water of the garden, which Dave read. I'm not going to read it all the way through. I'm going to move right about the four rivers. Okay? We know that it must be, because of Tigris and Euphrates, it must be where? In the Middle East, right? Uh, basically, where all the <laughs> happenings are going on right now in, our, in the Earth's history, sad to say. If you look at the map, uh, a lot of people say that, well, if you go online, right, right there is where they say they think the Garden of Eden was. Okay? Which may be, uh, some say, no, it was up here. Some say, no, it was right in the middle there. And many think it was right here. Right where... Israel is where Jerusalem, city of Jerusalem is located. Let's move on. It says here again, now if you look at the rivers in yellow, you can see the rivers in yellow moving out. Four rivers. Now they said that the space shuttle and one of its unique cameras, underground cameras, they found a river underneath here jetting out and going all the way underneath but it's totally covered with sand. That's interesting. I think when the flood, you know, and the earthquakes and the who knows what came along, it just shifted things and moved things around and displaced things. But in the, we know it's still in this general vicinity, okay? This next map, when I went online, they say that Eden was pretty much right in here. So part of it is literally covered under water. And they calculate that because of the mountain ranges and the this and the that. And if you, you can really get into nitty gritty about it, but many, uh, majority of people think it was right here, which kind of makes sense. The Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden, eastward, okay? And there he put man whom he had formed, and the Lord took the man and put him into the garden to dress it, to keep it. Two special trees were in the garden, as we heard, and out of the ground made, made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to sight, good for food, the tree of life, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And of course, he commands that we could eat of any tree freely, but not of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. If you did, you would die. I love this picture. Uh, the fish jumping out of the water and everyone's, everything's peaceful and happy and thriving and growing and whoa to live like that would be just something wouldn't it the garden he was not only Adam's dwelling it was his school it was his classroom did you know that as in that school, so in the school of earth, two trees are planted. The tree of life, which bears the fruit of true education. Okay? And then the tree of knowledge, yielding the fruit of science. False education. We have true education, false education. Even today, we have that, don't we? We have true education and false education. All that have connection with Christ have access to the tree of life. Let me read that again. All that have connection with Christ have access to the tree of life. What tree of life? Well, we're going to get into it. A source of knowledge of which the world is ignorant. After sin entered this world, the heavenly husbandman, the gardener, the orchard person, plant, transplanted the tree of life to the paradise above. But its branches hang over the wall to the lower world. Through the redemption purchased by the blood of the Son of God, 
man may now partake of this life-giving fruit. So it's still available to us. The tree of knowledge has its roots in the earth too, though. So they're still both there. It's on the earth, and it's earthly. Okay? You got the heavenly tree, and you got the earthly tree. All who have tasted of this heavenly fruit, the bread of life, are to be co-workers with God. Like Adam was a worker in the garden, we are workers still for him in his garden. Pointing others from the tree of knowledge to the tree of life. That they may also partake of its fruit. So I found this online. I have a note sheet that I'm going to give to you. I don't have this copied for you, but you can go online to a site that I have written out for you. And they did a really good job on this. Uh, I was pretty fascinated with it. It's got the three trees there. You've got the tree of knowledge, of good and evil on this side. Oops. Got the wrong clicker. On this side, right here. And then on this one, you've got the tree of life. And then in the middle, you've got the cross, which is also a tree, as we're going to find out. It's interesting that as you look at this pretty carefully, you can't see it really clearly, but uh, you've got the physical world, Satan, the spirit of error. And then on the other side, you've got the kingdom of God, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth. And in the middle, you've got the Trinity and our Lord Jesus Christ, who is our Savior, Lord, and friend, and the Word of God, who was allowed himself to be crucified on a tree, of all things. A tree. Hmm. And down below, you have the physical fruit and you have the spiritual fruit. Of course, the spiritual fruit are the fr is the fruits of the Spirit. And on the other side, you have opposite of the fruits of the Spirit. You've got fear, you've got confusion and pride and lies and selfishness and, you know, despair. You know, all those things that are earthly, that are worldly, that God didn't want us to know about and learn about. And down below, it has the testimony of our body, our mind, our, our soul, our spirit. And it says, you know, we... If we have the Word of God, then we can, by faith, overcome the evilness, the, the knowledge of good and evil that is out in the world. So, go to this and, and check it out for yourself. And uh, Message of the Cross, it's, it's a good diagram. I like it. And I thought I'd just plug that in there for you. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So that was the first promise that Christ ever gave to us. That he would come and take care of things. Take care of us. And provide a way of escape from the world and from everything the world has to offer that's bad for us. And he's going to offer everything that is good for us. The garden Eden remained upon the earth long after man had become an outcast from its pleasant paths. The fallen race were long permitted to gaze upon the home of innocence, their entrance barred only by the watching angels. And at the cherubim guarded gate of paradise, the divine glory was revealed. Hither, hither came Adam and his sons to worship God. Here they renewed their vows of obedience to the law that, to that law that the transgression of which had banished them from Eden. When the tide of iniquity overspread the world and the wickedness of men determined their destruction by the flood, flood waters, the hand that had planted Eden withdrew it. Wow, what a feat. Think about that. This brought it right up from the earth. But in the final restitution, when there shall be a new heaven and a new earth, it is to be restored more gloriously adorned than at the beginning. Wow, is that even possible? Yes. Anything is possible with God. More gloriously adorned? I think he's been keeping it pretty, in pretty good condition and shape and he's probably improving upon it all these thousands of years, don't you think? <laughs> then Jesus came to them to a place called what? Gethsemane. Gethsemane. And it's also known as the Garden of Gethsemane. He had an attraction for gardens. 
didn't he, our Lord? And you look at it, it's beautiful. It's just, it's, they say it pretty much looks like that today. With the olive trees and everything all about. And the location again, if you were to look at it here, it says, uh, here's Jerusalem in the middle. Oh, my little, there's, right here. And then over here you've got the Mount of Olives, the Garden of Gethsemane, right here. Kind of blending together. Here's the temple. Okay? So kind of keep that visualization of that in mind. And here's another map. Kind of pretty much saying the same thing. You've got the Mount of Olives, Garden of Eden. You've got the temple here. And then over here is where the crucifixion took place. And the tomb of Jesus is located. There is a picture I don't have here. I was going to show it to you. It wasn't real clear. But somebody had taken the Garden of Eden and masked it over this map. And it, it, it's beautiful. It's because over here, you know, and this, this guy, you had where the, the angels barred the way to get into the garden. Okay? And over here is where the first sacrifice, right here, of Adam and Eve by Christ to provide them clothing. And then every time they came to sacrifice, they were outside the garden here. They had to sacrifice. And then this is going to come into play here as we go along. You'll see what I'm trying to get at here. Um, quick illustration. In November 2010, a 19-year-old Muhammad, Osman Muhammad, was arrested. We hear a lot of this going on today. Muhammad, a Somali-born teen with Al-Qaeda links, was on a terrorist mission to blow up an explosive-laden van at a Christmas tree lighting, of all things, a Christmas tree lighting celebration in Oregon. He immediately became known as the Christmas tree bomber. The terrorist conspiracy had been in the works for some time. The FBI was able to thwart the evil plan because they had advanced knowledge of the conspirators' plans. Jesus had foreknowledge of the evil conspiracy that was to arrest and kill him. He had advanced knowledge of the plans of the chief priests and the elders of the people. He told his disciples, you know that the Passover takes place after two days the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Yet, even though he had advanced knowledge, Jesus did nothing to stop the evil plan. He willingly faced the deceitful conspiracy all the way to the end. Mohammed calls his followers to give their lives to kill others. The Son of God, the God of the Bible, his only begotten Son, to give his life so others might live eternally. And he did. And what a difference. What a difference of the two plans. You know, and Satan is that evil conspirator. If he had his way, none of us would be sitting here. We'd be nothing, gone, in the grave, sleeping, waiting for the Lord's return. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. The Garden of Eden with its, its foul plot of disobedience is to be carefully studied. This is coming from the pen of inspiration, she's saying. It should be carefully studied compared with the Garden of Gethsemane where the world's Redeemer suffered superhuman agony when the sins of the whole world were rolled upon him. Wow. Compare and contrast the two gardens. The Garden of Gethsemane, where Christ really, really suffered. And where he suffered in such pain and agony that he literally pretty much died right there. It was in the Garden of Gethsemane that the mysterious cup trembled in his hand. Would he drink of the bitter portion and save a lost world? Or would he forbear and let it perish? The destiny of the fallen race trembled in the balance. If he drank of the cup of suffering, he must open his breast to the griefs and woes and sins of humanity. He prayed, Oh my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. 
And he had said to his disciples, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. His suffering almost extinguished his life right there on the spot. That's how tremendous the suffering and anguish was. Drops of blood beaded upon his forehead and dewed on the sod of Gethsemane. His visage was so marred that more than any man, can you imagine that? And his form more than the sons of man. That's the toll it took upon our Savior. When he fainted, as in death, an angel came to the divine sufferer and offered him the cup of consolation to strengthen him for the conflict. Now if you recall, way back when, when Adam came into the, I mean Abraham came into the picture. Abraham called the name of the place that he was called to to give a sacrifice. The Lord will provide. As it is said to this day in the, in the mount of the Lord, Moriah, it shall be provided. And if you remember on one of those maps, Mount Moriah is where what sits? Jerusalem. The temple. Right there. On that spot of all spots. Isn't it amazing how the Lord just keeps honing in on this area of all places. It's a special area. I believe it's where the Garden of Eden existed. I believe it's where our Lord gave the first promise. I believe where it's the first sacrifice took place for Adam and Eve and then the sacrifices of his children and children's children before Eden was taken away. And now Jerusalem is there. And so if you look at this map again, Mount Moriah is right there where the temple is. Right there. And I will put enmity between you and the woman between your seed and her seed. So that promise was basically told to Abraham. He said, I'm going to fulfill, I'm going to provide a Savior. And this is what's going to happen though. There's going to be a lot of bruising going on. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Having become a curse for us. As it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So our Lord and Savior literally became a curse for us. Took upon Him our curse. Because of the disobedience and the law. So Golgotha, the tree of Golgotha, in the midst. Can you remember uh, when the scripture was being read this morning by day? Where were the trees located? In the midst. In the center of the garden. Okay? Between heaven and earth. Between God and man. Between the Father and the Spirit. Between life and death. Between time and eternity. Between law and grace. Between judgment and mercy. That's our cross that our Savior died on. The sacrifice of Christ as an atonement for sin is the great truth around which all other truths will cluster. In order to be rightfully understood and appreciated, every truth of the, in the Word of God, from Genesis all the way to Revelation, must be studied in the light which streams from the cross of Calvary. And we're told it's going to be our theme for ages to come. For all eternity, we're going to be studying this, this, this theme, this cross that Christ died on for us. And in connection with the wondrous central truth of the Savior's atonement, those who study the world's wonderful sacrifice grow in grace and, keyword, knowledge. God's knowledge. This knowledge. Not the world's knowledge. Not science. And all the other falsehoods that are out there. The cross of Christ. She says, I present before you the great grand monument of mercy and regeneration. Salvation and redemption. The Son of God lifted up on the cross of Calvary. 
This is to be the theme of every discourse, which you're hearing today. Christ declares, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. And we are approaching that season again. Passover time, again, April. It's, it's next week. Of course, the world calls it Easter. It's Passover. It's Passover. It's Passover. And it's all the Lord's work. Not ours. It's His doing. We have nothing to offer. And again, the Garden of Golgotha. Did you know there was another garden? Anybody? No? There was three gardens? We knew about the Garden of Eden. We knew about the Garden of Gethsemane. But there is another garden right here. You've got garden here. I think the Garden of Eden was here. And then you've got the Garden of Golgotha there. And I believe, in my mind's eye, do you think when God made a garden that it just filled this area here for Adam and Eve? I don't think so. I think God, you know, thinks big. I think the garden probably took up this whole area. The whole Garden of Eden was encompassed here. I believe so. We'll find out in heaven if that's the case. But the Garden of Golgotha, it says, Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. I, I missed that for some reason. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. Three gardens, three trees. And so I laid it out here, and I, I do have a sheet here that I would like to get into your hands. And I'll, I'll pass this out for you to peruse over it and kind of study it. I won't go into it in depth, but it's all laid out there. The first Adam, the second Adam, and the Savior. You had what happened in Eden all laid out there below Adam, the first Adam. You have below the second Adam, which is Christ, laid out there. Because what did, what did Spirit Prophecy say? We need to what? We need to compare them. Compare them together. And so, this is what I did. It took me some time. <laughs> but... I tried to lay it out in such a, you know, organized manner as things e evolved and developed. I like the one where it says, he told Adam and Eve not to eat, you know, but they took and they ate. But then Christ comes along and he drank the bitter cup. He took and drank. And then, of course, at the communion service, he emphasized what? Take and eat and take and drink. Okay? It's because it's my body, my blood. And so Christ tasted death for us. Okay? And it goes on. He endured the cross. He rested in the tomb. The Father watched over him. As he rested, he left the tomb. Thank the Lord. He's not there. He's risen. And we have life in Christ. And the comparing of the three trees. I went on and compared the tree of life, the tree of knowledge, and the tree, and the tree of the cross. But also you can go online and look this one up and kind of really get into it. Because it's fascinating, folks. It's just fascinating how it all kind of lines up. What a wonderful, wonderful plan that God had already in store for us way, way back in the beginning. He was prepared. He was ready to solve and, and fix it and rescue us. And the cross, it says, real quickly, I'll go over it. You know, God is, God is involved there. The Holy Spirit, Christ, and the Father were all there. Jesus is the truth. He took on the curse to bless us. Jesus is the life. Jesus is the light. He is perfect, but he took on sin for us. He's the Word of God. He took on the penalty of the law. Now we can be in the likeness of Christ, full of His Spirit. And He is the way, the only way, that we can have eternal life and have full access to the tree of life someday, literally. 
Without the cross, man could have no union with the Father. On it depends every hope. From it shines the light of the Savior's love. And when at the foot of the cross the sinner looks up to the one who died to save him, he may rejoice with fullness of joy. For his sins are pardoned. Wiped out. Gone. Never to be remembered again. Kneeling in faith at the cross, he has reached the highest place to which man can attain. The highest place. Before the foundation of the world, Christ pledged his word that he would give his life as a ransom if man turned from his allegiance to God. He revealed his love by humbling himself, stooping from heaven to work upon fallen, disorderly, lawless human beings. Of himself, man could not possibly cope with the enemy. Christ offers himself and all he has, his glory, his character, to the service of those who return their loyalty and keep the law of God. This is their only hope. Christ says definitely, I came not to destroy the law. It is a transcript of Christ's, Christ's character, God's character. And I came to carry out its every specification. I came to vindicate it by living it in human nature. Giving an example of perfect obedience. Tremendous plan of salvation. So, to wrap things up, where is the new Jerusalem going to be located? Of all places, guess where? Christ descends upon where? The Mount of Olives. For all eternity, where he came and lived and died, gave everything he had for us. It's going to be, oh, how can you say it? For eternity, not only our school again, but all the innumerable planets and universe of the universe and the people are going to come and want to step foot on this planet where Christ lived and died. Gave himself for us. After his resurrection he ascended and where the angels repeated the promise of his return. Says the prophet, the Lord my God shall come with all the saints with thee and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives which is before Jerusalem on the east. Well, the garden was there on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof. It's, it's going to just like that. Split and just like flat. As, as New Jerusalem comes down and settles down upon that very spot. And there shall be a great valley and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. And into that day shall there be one Lord. One Lord and his name one. So you can envision this new Jerusalem city coming down right over that spot where the Mount of Olives is to settle down and take its final resting place. And this place, this planet will become the habitation of God himself. The Trinity. And this place, this planet will become the capital of the universe. And we're going to be in the real university. Right there. The Garden of Eden. The new earth restored. Look what she has to say. Then, then they that have kept God's commandments shall breathe in immortal vigor beneath the tree of life. <sighs> Can you imagine that? It says, and through unending ages the inhabitants of the sinless worlds what? There she is. The inhabitants of the sinless worlds shall behold it. They're going to want to come and see it for themselves. Be there on that spot. And in that garden of delight a sample of the perfect work of God's creation. That he's not only done there, but he's done in our own lives. His perfect creation for us. The work he's accomplished through Christ for us. A sample of the perfect work. Untouched by the curse of sin. A sample of what the whole earth would become. That's what he originally wanted, you know, when he started that garden with Adam and Eve. He wanted us all to inhabit gardens and be in gardens and, you know, that's where our homes would be in our schools. 
and man, but fulfilled the Creator's glorious plan. Adam is reinstated in his first dominion. Transported with joy, he beholds the trees that were once his delight. The very trees whose fruit he himself gathered in the days of his innocence and joy. He sees the vines and his own, his own hands had trained. Wow, they're still there. The very flowers that he once loved to care for. His mind grasped the reality of the scene. He comprehends that this is indeed Eden restored. Between the school established in Eden at the beginning and the school of the hereafter, there lies the whole compass of earth's history. The history of human transgression, suffering, of divine sacrifice, and of the victory over death and sin. Not all the conditions of this first school of Eden will be found in the school of the future life. What do you, what do you mean? No tree of knowledge of good and evil will afford opportunity for, for temptation will be there. No tempter is there. Hallelujah. Praise God. No possibility of wrong. Every character has withstood the testing of evil and no one is susceptible to its power anymore. It's gone forever and ever and ever. And in the midst of the tree, on either side of the river, the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month, we're told we're going to gather there every month in worship to the Lord and also to partake of the tree of life. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Can you just visualize that? I mean, this is an artist's portrayal. We can't comprehend literally what it's going to look like. But it's going to be so glorious, so dazzling, so beautiful, so... oh. And it, it's going to be wonderful to gather around there with all the saints to partake of that tree. That beautiful tree of life. Restored to the tree of life in the long lost Eden, the redeemed will grow up to the full stature of the race in its primeval glory. That means we're going to grow up in this beautiful wonderful body like Christ that will live on for eternity that will never grow old and never get sick and never have pain and never, 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 never I believe we're even going to be taller I, I honestly believe that we're going to be taller we're going to be stronger uh, we're going to be like yeah, superhuman <laughs> the last lingering traces of the curse of sin will be removed and Christ's faithful ones will appear in the beauty of the Lord our God. Not our own beauty, but the Lord's beauty. In the mind and the soul and the body, reflecting the perfect image of their Lord. Oh, wonderful redemption, she says. Wonderful redemption. Long talked of, long hoped for, contemplated with eager anticipation, but never really fully understood. Never. I long to be there, folks. I don't want to miss out. I tell my kids all the time when I talk to them on the phone, how's your Christian walk going? I want you to be there. I don't want you to miss out. I want you to be there in Eden to partake of all its wonderful fruits and gifts that the Lord has in store for us. So there you have it, folks. I hope this has opened your eyes and... You learned something today. Three gardens, three trees. Just like the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Everything has to come in threes, doesn't it? Everything has to come in threes. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your wonderful plan of salvation. What a plan of redemption that only you can accomplish. All we have to do is accept it and cooperate with you and allow you to do that work that is only possible through your Holy Spirit, through your Holy Word. Lord, we look forward to that time when we will all 
all be reunited and all gathered there in that new city around that tree of life to partake of its life-giving fruit that will help us to live on for you for eternity, to glorify and only glorify you. And that's all we hope for, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.